Greetings, Darklings, from across the interweb. It is once again I, the Duchess Precious Ken, here for the Sounds and Shadows podcast. Um, I'm real excited. I have an uh, exciting guest here, somebody who is very active in the Sounds and Shadows group, and I've I've talked to quite a bit, and, and does some amazing visual things with the video on top of her music. So I can't wait to dive in and talk about a lot of that. I have with me today, Sam from Barihari. Hello, Sam. Hi. <laughs> Welcome. Good to have you with us and see you in person. You know, I, I chat with you online a little bit um, and I see your videos, but it's the first time I uh, got to see you uh, there in the flesh. So hello. Hello. Yeah, it's a little different. Usually my uh, my profile pictures or my avatars are very serious and I'm just like, I, I, I like have that a goofy about smile on my face. <laughs> I, I like a, a lady who looks like she might run me through with a sword at any given moment. And I, I think that's important for men to respect that. Absolutely. It's pretty on brand too. Um, so I want to get started here, uh, rolling into it. I, we got a lot to cover. Um, and the first thing I always like to kind of ask is there was some moment in your past, whether it was you went to a concert, you heard an album for the first time. I don't know. You saw Hellraiser, whatever. Something happened and it kind of clicked for you that this kind of dark macabre style of music was you and was a part of who you are. And tell me a little bit about kind of what that was and what propelled you into the scene. Wow. Um, that's really funny because when I was a kid, I was really, I loved Halloween. Like mm -hmm. I loved the costume aspect of it. I love going out and getting candy and all of the all of that stuff. Like the the creativity of Halloween. Yeah. But I was so scared shitless of everything scary. <laughs> so it was like I was inter interested in the creative aspect of it. Um, but Halloween kind of was always a major role in like a very important day in my life. Yeah. Um, and I think um not until I watched Labyrinth. <laughs> And I saw like these spooky little goblins and like the goblin king. And it's like not really that dark or gothic of a movie, but I think it has become kind of like a gothic staple because of David Bowie and Brian Proud's imagery and all of that. Sure. Um, so I think Labyrinth was the one of the first movies that I saw where I was just like, wow, that's like dark and spooky and I can hang with it. Like, it, you know, there was like training wheels on it. Yeah. Was a little spooky. No, hey, um, <laughs> Labyrinth was spooky. Like kid movies it when was. I was a kid were freaking dark. Like yes. Secret and Nim, Labyrinth, Dark Crystal. No, that never shit was story. Spooky. Never. Yes. The horse still to yeah. this day. Yes. I can watch that, that was... as a 45 year old man and I'll miss stuff. Like that's intense. Yeah. Absolutely um so I think that and then it like I don't know I, at a certain point I just knew that I was drawn to like cemeteries and like s cathedrals and like all of that spooky imagery but I felt like kind of a poser because I didn't listen to any of the dark music um because I grew up with pop music like my parents my parents are first are not even they're immigrants from Mexico so mm -hmm. they they kind of just like listen to whatever was on the radio and it help them learn English and kind of like assimilate into culture and whatever so I grew up with like Madonna and Abba and um I don't um, know like Madonna whatever Madonna is goth as fuck and I will not True. hear against it um True. <laughs> I, I completely agree so I guess that was one of the things that I had to like you know I look back on now and I'm like oh, actually she is super goth um <laughs> sorry just plug in my computer there um yeah so after that um my gateway I always joke that my my gateway drug into goth was Evanescence <laughs> I was like yeah I saw that record and I heard I heard uh I think the first single I actually heard was My Immortal which is like that really sad piano we yeah. one no it's just a jam like, that's a jam yeah I was like this is so pretty and sad and dark and like I didn't for the first time I thought that like dark music didn't have to be aggressive and uh masculine it could be it could yeah. be feminine and beautiful and whatnot and then I just kind of like dive like I, I just went into you know the cure and like the smiths and I started watching vh1 at you know two in the morning and discovering the other stuff that I liked well you will find on our show that I hold very seriously that 
it bugs the hell out of me when people act as though they came firing out of the womb with some inherent knowledge <laughs> of the Sisters yeah. of Mercy's B sides or something. No, we like all, the bat, like bats flew out of them. Yeah, or we all had, <laughs> I don't know, a sibling, a friend, an uncle, a teacher, uh, somebody brought us in and showed us this stuff mm -hmm. and we all find it at different times and who gives a shit like there are no special magical points that you get because you I don't know heard an album 10 years before somebody else um, absolutely <laughs> so I love that I love that story and no I mean going along with the labyrinth thing I think that makes a lot of sense I just did an interview we released with uh Aurelio Voltaire and mm -hmm. you know for the new album the dark labyrinth black labyrinth and yeah black labyrinth. about or yeah we talked about um you know when he would meet kind of some of his idols uh like you know Richard from the psychedelic furs or things like that and he's talking about how much Bowie and the labyrinth influenced him mm -hmm. and then they're like so who influenced you then and he's like oh no it was the same it was still Bowie and it was <laughs> and, and yeah. how far back that goes where it was a true story for all of us regardless of what decade you were born in mm -hmm. so Mm -hmm. no, yeah it's I... funny you bring up Voltaire because I actually uh I used to go to his shows a lot because I grew up in like Riverside County but in, here in California so it's like inland and then he used to play in San Diego a lot um so one of my friends used to book shows back when she was like 16 years old so when we were both 16 she would invite me to these shows and so I would hang out backstage with Voltaire and what? like, yeah, it's just so funny. Like I still have a picture of myself with like this ugly purple wig <laughs> and I'm just like, I'm like 90, like 18 years old, like hugging Voltaire backstage at some show in San Diego or whatever. So yeah, it, and it's funny because like I, the first time I saw Voltaire, I did not know any of his songs because this was before like, you could just go on Spotify mm -hmm. and like see what they're about. So I'm like, okay, he wears black and skulls and stuff. So I'll probably like it. So I went and I had no idea it was gonna be funny. Like I had no idea he was gonna take the piss out of everybody. And I just, I was just like, why are, why aren't more shows like this? It's more, it's like first you like strip back this facade and you just have a good time. And to me, that was so important. So we, we talked about that a lot. I mean, because for me and Amaranth, we are also a very silly goth band, you know, that writes mm -hmm. songs about ninjas and ass play and stuff. And so, yeah, I mean, in college, when I got into Voltaire, it was very much a awakening for me and a big deal that like, I'd been listening to goth music for a long time, but I'm like, wait, it can be stupid yeah. and funny. Like, and <laughs> yeah. And I wouldn't even say we're <laughs> stupid because his stuff is no, very it's not. clever and witty. The humor mm -hmm. in it is not like goofy fart jokes or something. You know, it is very much uh, eloquent, witty humor. So yeah, I've always yeah, and it's also very beautiful. Like there, I, mm -hmm. I, I, the album titles kind of escape me sometimes, but that one with feathery wings on it. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Like all of those songs are so beautiful they just remind me of a renaissance fair because there's just like you know there's some beautiful strings and the arrangements and the lyricism is poetic and it's really pretty so i love that you know we got into and we're talking about previous interviews and voltaire and mm -hmm. but now tell me a little bit about um your music and and what makes it unique for you? Because I, I, when I hear your music and how I've reviewed it, I would say there's three things that really stand out to me. Number one, you have just this powerful voice that I don't expect. You know, you you are not a you are not Aretha Franklin. You are not a large <laughs> person that belts out there. But then when you do it, you it cuts like a laser. You have a very focused, strong voice. So that's one thing. Number two is the fact that it's so real. I mean, the music is somewhat dark pop and, and upbeat a little bit in a lot of ways. But when you listen to lyrics and the subject matter, you lay it all on the line for everyone to hear of kind of your trauma, your experience. Mm -hmm. And I, I think there's something captivating about that in that you can always tell when someone is giving you the the real dirt of their soul unburdened, you know, and I think mm -hmm. that's not. And then the third thing that I can't wait to get into later is all the visual stuff you do that you make yourself DIY, like all the costumes and effects and in the videos. So 
tell me a little bit about what it looks like when you have an idea that sparks and what it takes to turn that into a song. Wow, uh, good question. Um, I always joke that I'm a failed theater kid. So like in high school, I really wanted to be in theater. So I took theater classes and, but I just like didn't have a very, um, I don't know how to put it, like a, a clean look. Cause I was, I was goth in high school. So I had like, you know, black hair and things and like red streaks and like black eyeliner all the time. And I, I was just kind of like, my look so I would go for auditions and I didn't really fit any of the parts and whatever sure. and I was also super shy but um I did get that into does hurt you in the theater a little. <laughs> yeah uh but because of that I got into improv comedy um so I just kind of like learned that I work best when I'm just like improvising I guess yeah. Sure. yeah um so I guess I to answer your question is like I write music I've never considered myself a musician I just kind of write from um like a theatrical perspective um I'm always interested in like world building or like the music that I've always been drawn to the most has a very strong not even it doesn't even necessarily have to have like a strong visual it just has to paint a picture like you can listen with headphones close your eyes and you feel like you're transported it's into a it, another it's world you're, you're or yeah yeah or even you know there's just like something about it that doesn't just feel like radio music radio rock whatever it just it sounds like they did it with the intention of creating this like alternate reality I suppose now do you and that's very interesting for me because I there's parallels with kind of how I write and how I do it in that do you actually like kind of storyboard your song idea when you say I use the word world creating so as somebody mm -hmm. who is a dungeon master and and likes to <laughs> nice. you know, it made me think of that do you kind of I don't know get a spark of an idea and you really kind of write out almost like an an image or a story that you kind of put out where you're like okay now I'm going to add music into this I'm going to make the lyrics fit but first you kind of put together the idea of this story you're trying to tell um actually I don't think so because um like I was saying about improvising like I feel when I when I try too hard to make be like okay this is the idea and it's gotta you know pan out like this yeah. um there it just like creates too much of a constraint and like too much pressure on me to make it fit that exact idea so most of my songs actually come from like I'll be having conversations with people and then they'll like maybe throw out an idiom that I've never heard before or that I have heard before then and then I just like really stop to think about it and or they phrase something a certain way and it'll just be like a few words that my brain just kind of like hangs on to and so I'll kind of go into songwriting with like that idea in mind and then it, it'll I'll like ask myself what it makes me feel like what kind of topic does that evoke um and then with the improvisation thing I just kind of improvise and then I realize like that's what I'm feeling that's what that phrase made me think of that's you know I had to let that out so I, I guess it's just it's very like haphazard <laughs> no no that I, that makes sense <laughs> and and it speaks to the ADD in my heart as well oh my god I'm like too much of a plan <laughs> A plan? Who needs one of those? I'll, figure, I'll use Napoleon's plan. First we show up and then we see what happens. Okay, Actually, it worked really out. Bad for Napoleon, so that's a bad example. But still. Did, yeah, and I hope it works out better for us. Um, okay, next thing I want to ask about is you kind of brought up uh, that you're there in L.A. And that, you know, at a young age, you were going to concerts around uh, San mm -hmm. Diego. and play. It's kind of a unique thing there when you're talking about places like Berlin, New York, LA. Mm -hmm. Look, if you're in the arts, it's a different vibe in cities of that magnitude and also the artistic slant of them. How do you think that kind of shaped you? Do you think that was kind of a part of your artistic journey that when I hear Motley Crue, it sounds like Los Angeles. There's There is a bit of that city that do you think that that's a part of your music where Los Angeles or California has kind of shaped the music you make? Or do you think you would have told the same stories if you would have been anywhere? Uh, um, well, as the example that you provide, like I, when I think of California, I think of like 
Lana Del Rey, Red Hot Chili Peppers, Motley Crue, like they have, they evoke this air of like, this is what life, this is what the subculture is like in California. Sure. The glitz and um, glamour of the Sunset Strip, all that jazz. Absolutely. But um, being that I was involved in like the gothic subculture growing up, um, I think that that has kind of informed um, the things I do because as I said previously, I, I don't, I never started with music. Like I didn't start mm -hmm. writing music until I was 27. So it was like way later in my life. Oh, wow. um, and I started, um, my first creative outlet was drawing, drawing and painting. And then through that, I met a lot of artists in LA and photographers, so I started modeling. And then through modeling, I met, you know, costume designers and all these different kinds of art forms interweave over here because it is like such a mecca for right. creative people. Um, so that was influential because it was never too much of one thing all at once. You know what I mean? Like I, I, I got to have conversations with people that, that took photos that made movies that you know actors musicians whatever so I think that that like fueled my creativity in that sense but it also <laughs> kind of made me want to do all of it at once <laughs> so that has been a little bit of a problem but we won't talk about that um yeah so uh so I don't know if I would have been doing the same kind of I don't think I would be doing music uh, to be completely honest if I lived anywhere else because I wouldn't have had people, collaborators nearby that would encourage me to do it or that taught me how to do it or like any of that stuff. And also since the visual element is so important to me, um, we have a lot of access to um, cool locations, you know, um, videographers, people that can help out with the creative process. Right. So that is way more motivating. Um, that being said, though, I think LA can be a kind of like I'm. I actually do not live in LA. I live uh, like thirty miles outside. So I think yeah, like who could yeah, I'm in. To live in actually. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I know you can if you want to live in a closet, but you know right. I need space. <laughs> um, so being in LA can be a little bit like, especially as a young person, it is. Uh, you know, you just want to be surrounded by like creative people there are a lot of people out there that are very predatory um yeah. towards young girls um young people in general but you know being a young woman in in los angeles had let me led me into some uh less than savory situations but um but yeah so overall like especially I guess, as an artist you're out there trying to you know get forward to learn to and it does i mean it's a terrible environment in a lot of ways for people who genuinely are going into situations trying to move their career forward to learn more and how do you tell the monsters from everybody else you know yeah and... absolutely yeah so like in small doses LA can be very inspiring um but I just tell people like be careful where you put your energy because uh there are people looking to prey prey on you so I want to jump in now um, and kind of talk. You've had two uh, recent videos and singles come out, but the most recent one uh, here just released, and it was Agoraphobic. Um, mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit about that one, why it was exciting for you, and kind of what was the, the impetus behind this song and really awesome video, like the visuals in it. Thanks. Um, I'm glad you say that because uh, that was the the lowest budget video that I have created to date. <laughs> oh, wow. Uh, yeah. So, I guess to uh, start off with the the story behind the song. Um, as we know, COVID happened, um, and it forced people to stay indoors, and it also, um for people that care about their health and the health of others created that anxiety of like, wow, this is, this shit's really bad. And I can't believe I'm living through this right now. Um, but I had touched on the subject of like isolation and, you know, feeling outside from the, or feeling othered from the outside world before, um, mostly because I have an autoimmune disease that has um, 
put me through periods of isol like forced isolation of like not being able to leave the house for long periods of time. Um, so I'm no stranger to the, the forced isolation and long yeah. periods of it. Um, but the pandemic made it different because it was not by choice. It was mandatory. And then on top of that, being extra scared about getting sick or like, you know, my loved one's getting sick. And then me with like the autoimmune disease, I don't know, I could get it and I could be fine or it could, you know, further disable me forever. And, um, I've been lucky enough, knock on wood at this point not having I've never had COVID not yet because I'm very careful um but yeah like it, it just created this like extreme panic in me sure. um and then when things started to loosen up like you know the the hope of the vaccine and like the slow opening of of venues and oh, all these things it was like bittersweet because it felt hopeful but at the same time it felt terrifying like I was having dreams you let every your night guard about, like, down oh. yeah yes I, and, and a lot of also... did, not just you I mean and so you have to think about that I when you were saying that I think about that too that it wasn't so much that I was always really worried or going to shows but I think about the fact of I go visit my mom after mm-hmm. I go to a show or something and what would I feel like forever if she got Mm -hmm. sick, you know, and I think that's the other aspect, you know, that wasn't talked about so much is it wasn't just about, you know, yes, that anxiety of you going out there, but everybody in your life that you can affect every time you got behind a wheel of a guitar, a car and decided to go hang out. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it was like bittersweet because like you, I didn't want to stop people from going out and living their lives, but like, and at the very beginning with the, like the first two vaccines or whatever, I, like a lot of other people thought we were like basically immortal. I was like, oh, we can't get it now. We can go hug and, and, right. you know, do, sh- you know, go to shows and whatever. And then when the news started coming out, they're like, oh, actually it's not as, you know, as impenetrable as we originally thought that, that like panic kind of just like seeped in again. And then I just like felt like, um, that just agoraphobia I was just like afraid like I was finding myself getting can't like anxiety attacks at the grocery store or like if if my boyfriend was gonna go to a show or hang out with a group of his friends I'd be like I'm not gonna tell you not to go but I'm like terrified and I just wouldn't go uh it was just like it, it's just misery it's just like this terror terror of the outside world and other people and I just noticed that people became a lot more like short tempered behind the wheel and like Mm -hmm. a lot more selfish because when you know when the mass mandates kind of softened um everyone was like fuck fuck everyone else I don't want to do it I don't want to do this anymore and then it just like all those feelings on top of the news just being fucking horrible all the time I was just like I fucking hate people I do not want to go outside and this is really bad because I have to go outside if I want to live my life. So it's just that song is basically about that, that push and pull of like, I know I need to get over it, but at the same time, I'm scared. And oh my God, what do I do? Yeah, I think a big part of what you're saying, and heck, like four years later, I think this is still very true in terms of the bigger collective mindset people have, because we don't see folks much. I mean, I work from home. Like Mm -hmm. I have Rachel around and I'm lucky that at least I have one human I interact with on a regular basis, not over video screens. But for a lot of people, you just don't. And I think when you don't see people shake their hands, give them a hug, like it is harder, I think, to remember to think beyond yourself because Mm -hmm. you just don't have contact like we're used to all the time at the grocery store or whatever, you know? Yeah. So no, I, I I love that. And I love the idea of it. And and I want to push into kind of the other part of it, because I think it's something else that's really unique about you is how much you do um, to create the visuals for all of your videos or your live performances. But when you have these elaborate kind of medieval costume dresses and the sort this isn't something like you went to a Ren fair and picked up. <laughs> you sewed this, you know, yourself and envisioned it and put it together. Tell me a little bit about 
how that's important to the art you're making. Because like you said, it didn't even start out as about music for you. It kind mm -hmm. of, this aspect was the gateway that led to you doing music. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, well, just to finish the thought with the agoraphobic video, um, it's funny you mentioned the costume things because that's one of the first videos in this cycle where there were no costs. It was not costuming. Right. It was just like, like, you know, nightgowns and whatever. And I just wanted to, to kind of portray a, how it, like just being stuck at you home and very not stripped down. <laughs> yeah. Like just very stripped back and, and like yeah. without the, you know, the drama of like Renaissance queen or whatever. Right. Um, but yeah, the, so I taught myself how to sew, um, long time ago it stemmed from like a, a surgery that I had and I had a lot of downtime at home and I just was not going to go back to work anytime soon so yeah. like I watched Crimson Peak <laughs> and I was just like wow those costumes are fucking rad I'm sure I could make something like that <laughs> so one of my first like actual sewing attempts was to make one of the nightgowns from Crimson Peak which <laughs> looking back isn't my best work but you know it was the I mean that's a segue. pretty ambitious uh, uh yeah <laughs> yeah absolutely um and I've always just been like drawn to this like like I just love how you step into a costume and your mannerisms change and like your your confidence changes like you become a character and so I think that's a reason, a big reason why I've uh, pushed kind of that avenue, because as I was saying earlier, I am pretty shy. Um, so I think that it um, enables that kind of like actress side to come out a little bit. Um, uh, so yeah, sorry if I forgot the second half no, of the question. I, I love that. And and that's something I, I can really pitch with you. Because like I said, when I've seen maybe not the, the most recent one that, that we talk about here, but some of your other videos where you kind of have like Joan of Arc type armor, or or I remember you did a collab once I saw where you were doing sword work in it. And to me, when you tell me, sure, I mean, being in California or there are things where I've had to learn lessons and think about there are bad, dangerous people in this scene. Mm -hmm. And I, I kind of really picture, you know, when you're there is this character in this armor with your weapon or whatever, I will F up literally anybody. I don't care. Like there is a yeah. fearlessness that comes with kind of having that costume on but it becomes your persona on stage or on screen or what have you and I I think that's something a lot of people feel when getting into I don't know a cosplay at a convention or whether it's you know a more professional theatrical thing or what have you but to me I think that's a big part of what it's about for people and also for other you know, uh, maybe younger girls seeing you in the music video, like looking like that. And then they think about doing the same thing for the same reason, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, I'm definitely not the first to do it. Like I think about how like Kate Bush did very similar stuff. I've gotten compared to Kate Bush a few times or even uh, all of my Chemical Romances albums and how they have like personas that go along with it or the you know the king david bowie how every album cycle was like not only did he sound different and look different he was different like he just became this new character and that was i think something that i that was very important to me at the um beginning of me ever thinking about having a project and even in the way that i named myself because i did borrow my name from the uh, silent film actress theta barra mm -hmm. and like i just love the costuming and these silent films and just like the way that they can emote without talking um and just the heavy makeup and just like this super dramatic and like oh I love it so I think that I don't think I could ever just like go on stage in jeans or like whatever you know what I mean um to me the costuming is not necessarily a crutch it's just like an extension of of who I am 
I mean, I do it a little bit, but I could definitely go on stage in probably pajamas and take a nap. Yeah. Afterwards. But that that's yeah. I'm... And there's nothing wrong with that. That's, that. That just shows me that you're very comfortable. Like when I go see a band and they're just like in, you know, a t-shirt and jeans and whatever, and they're like rocking out super hard. I'm just like, oh man, that's <laughs> fucking cool. But you know me, I'm like, oh, I need to go in like a edwardian dress and like you I, know whatever i see that i respect <laughs> it because i i'm like man i could never put that much effort into anything wow <laughs> yeah. what a, somebody is up there with a plan and i am proud <laughs> to see it you know um so we are to the point in the interview now um before i want to spin out here to the new video um and give everybody a taste of that where we're a music review page first and foremost and so i always kind of like to hear if there's anything that's inspiring or or to you rather it's maybe some of your uh uh mates at uh, remission i know that you mm -hmm. uh you know are on remission there and release things there or somebody you've played with or just heard recently are there any kind of uh new bands in the scene that you think uh we need to go check out here at sounds and shadows oh yeah um i actually discovered this band out of san diego called uh twin ritual Ooh, okay so, i don't, I don't know, know that. You, wow. yeah you should look up the song alley um and it sounds very like if like if Susie and the Banshees was a little bit more glam I guess um I'm here for that yeah yeah they are super good um outside of the scene I've been listening to a lot of this artist called Ethel Kane um I don't know if either. you've heard of her yeah she's um a singer out of Florida of all places but she has this album called um preacher's daughter that is a concept album that you think is like this beautiful love story but it actually is like about her leaving her hometown hitching a ride with somebody across the country and then eventually they cannibalize her <laughs> like <laughs> but it's done okay, i was this, about like, to be like so it's got a very uh you know dolly part oh wait no that's a dark twist that's yes. that's more of a nick cave than a dolly parton there it's like if nick cave and like lana del rey and dolly parton like just had this fucked up love child um well, that I'm would be now yes yeah you should check out the song strangers <laughs> um but i i honestly think if you're gonna go into it you need to experience the full concept album <laughs> yeah I'm, I'm gonna go check that out for sure this has been so great getting to chat with you and talk with you and i always like i said we're going to spin out here uh to the new single agoraphobia um but i look forward to the new releases coming out and where can people go to uh find your music and check you out um, well, right now I'm trying to push uh, Spotify, so look me up, Barahari, um, as well as uh, YouTube. You can see all of the videos that I've made. Um, yeah, so just keep your eyes peeled on there, and then I also have a record coming out May 26th, so it'll be on vinyl through Remission Entertainment. That's awesome. I'm so excited. What, he does such a great job, too, of finding things that I would go get on vinyl, but would usually never be an option, and yeah. so I'm so happy for you that you got I, i'm gonna have to go get that wax like i i can't <laughs> wait to go get it on vinyl that'll be great all right yeah. so all of you out there in interweb land please uh like and subscribe so you can learn about more great artists like sam and everybody out there in interweb land keep it dark yo <laughs>